Hello, thank you for joining us today at the Asia Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defence Dialogues Southeast Asia Symposium. We're delighted that we have more than 200 people who've registered for this event from across government, diplomacy, uh, business, civil society, academia, think tanks, and many more. And we welcome you all for joining us today. My name is Melissa Conley Tyler. I'm the program lead at AP4D, and I acknowledge that I'm speaking today for the land of the Anawan people. It's a great reminder to think about the long history of the Southeast Asian Australian engagement through Australia's First Peoples. For many centuries, despite not having originally a common language, uh, there was mutually beneficial trade between the north of Australia and Macassan uh, area. And if you look at that as an example, the way it transformed culture uh, across trade routes across Australia, you can see what an extraordinary history we have and how much we have to live up to in Australia's Southeast Asia engagement. Um, I'm delighted to be sharing with you today uh, a little bit about the work that AP4D has been doing on Southeast Asia. We are going to start with a um, with an outline really of who is AP4D, uh, who got behind us and made this work possible, and what are the key issues that we're trying to deal with in the region. So to do that for us, we'll start off with uh, Professor Michael Wesley, who is going to take us through what is AP4D, Angela Fitzsimons from the ASS. Australian Civil and Military Centre, who'll talk a bit about the appeal of AP4D. Um, Paul Natoy from ASPE is going to give us a bit of an idea of the challenges and trends in Southeast Asia. And then I'm going to report on what comes out of the process that we've been working on. In the second half, we're then going to turn to look in more detail about what came out of the working groups from uh, who have been working on our Southeast Asia programme. And um, we're delighted that we'll have uh, duos telling us about the in more detail and give you a chance to have some questions and answer. Now, the question and answer is already enabled. So if you have any questions at any time, just please put them in there. We'd be delighted to see them. Um, the webinar is also being live captioned. So if you'd like to make use of that, um, please do follow the link that's been put in the chat. The chat will be open the whole time for messages from us and we'll be, um, do have a look and see what's been put in there about uh, things you can read, things you can explore further, because we very much want this to be interactive. So without any further ado, let me please turn over to Michael Wesley, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne and Co-Chair of AP4D. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Melissa, thank you and welcome to everyone uh, to this, uh, this wonderful occasion in which we're launching really our first substantive piece of work. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about where AP4D came from and how it works and, what, and, and I guess uh, what, what the rationale of our work is. Uh, AP4D um, really began, I think, in a conversation between myself and Mark Purcell, the, the co-chairs of AP4D, um, years ago when I was still at ANU. Uh, we had a, a really good conversation. Bridie Rice was part of it. Uh, and uh, we discussed the fact that Australia's destiny, as always, is very much tied up with our ability to engage with and exercise influence in our near uh, regions, the Pacific, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, and South, A South Asia as well. However, uh, we, are, we were very aware that uh, the situation which Australia faces in seeking to engage and exercise influence in these regions has become more complex over time. Obviously, uh, the buffeting winds of geopolitical competition, uh, as well as Australia's declining relative size to uh, countries in our region, particularly those in the Asian region, mean that we have to work harder and we have to work smarter in order to achieve our objectives in these parts of the world that are so important to us. We also acknowledged uh, at 
from the very start that uh, Australia has made uh, enormous uh, gains in terms of uh, our engagement in, uh, in our diplomacy, in our defence engagement, and also in our development assistance in these parts of the world. But perhaps uh, these three arms of Australian statecraft are not as joined up or mutually reinforcing as they could be. And so the idea, the animating idea behind AP4D is what can we do? How can we convene a conversation that brings all of these crucial arms of Australian statecraft together into mutually reinforcing coordination, collaboration, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and new initiatives as well. So uh, the first thing we did was to search for allies. And we were able to uh, put together a wonderful, um, uh, really executive committee of AP4D, bringing together some of the best minds from across Australia uh, in the fields of diplomacy, defence and development assistance. Uh, and we also started to reach out to organisations, universities, think tanks, uh, NGOs, uh, who really uh, eagerly came on board. I think I would be right in saying that every single organisation that we've reached out to has eagerly supported what we've done. And uh, we now have, I think, a formidable collection of uh, organisations, public organisations in Australia that are supporting us. And so uh, we then uh, were very uh, grateful and fortunate to have um, uh, a conversation with the Australian Civil Military Centre. I'm not going to say too much more about that because Angela is going to speak about our relationship to the ACMC. And uh, we also uh, were very fortunate to uh, be able to uh, uh, persuade Melissa Conley Tyler, uh, one of our leading public intellectuals, someone with an incredible pedigree of putting together um, initiatives in Australia's international relations to come aboard uh, really as our intellectual guiding force and, and taking it forward. Uh, we, we then uh, conceived of a work plan uh, to look at how AP4D could work in practice uh, to provide uh, real ideas, policy ready ideas uh, for Australia's more effective operations uh, in our near regions. And uh, you'll be hearing the first of those later on. The work plan then became a series of projects developed out of uh, a really extensive array of consultations uh, across Australia. Uh, I think Melissa will probably talk about uh, how extensive those consultations were uh, to really bring together and use Australia's best minds to think about where we might concentrate our efforts. And of course, a Southeast, a Southeast Asia work plan was conceived and born and uh, initiated and uh, implemented in the second half of 2021. Uh, we were very, very lucky and very fortunate to attract some absolutely brilliant minds, people who have been deeply involved in Australia's international relations, either as practitioners or as, uh, a, a, as analysts and intellectuals. Uh, they work together in uh, several uh, task forces, uh, really collecting together and uh, brainstorming ideas and information. And some of that you will be hearing uh, a little bit later on in the second part of our program. The next program of work is going to be applying uh, the AP4D methodology to the Pacific. Uh, that work is already well underway and will un un unroll in the first half of 2022. And uh, we hope we'll be uh, convening a very similar seminar to this um, uh, in, uh, in the second part of this year. So that's all I will say. I'm incredibly proud and, uh, and supportive of the work that Melissa and the entire AP4D community has done. Uh, I think it's incredibly important. I had a coffee with 
the Deputy Secretary for Southeast Asia in DFAT this morning. She's very excited about the work that AP4D has done and is really keen to engage with us further as uh, the department thinks about the ideas that we've put together. But without further ado, Melissa, I will hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think that's got across so clearly that we are a platform. Um, it's all about bringing people together and, get, and providing an opportunity for people to work together across the different sectors. Um, our, our tagline was always reimagining Australia's future um, international engagement. And so anyone who's interested in being part of that project, we want to involve. So if I can now turn to Angela Fitzsimons, um, who is the director of the Australian Civil and Military Centre. Um, we had a lot of ideas, but without ACMC support, what we're doing today would not have been possible. To over to you, Angela. Thank you, Melissa. Um, the Australian Civil and Military Centre is a small organisation located in Queanbeyan, and it's sponsored by Defence. And that we're charged with the support of developing national civil military police capabilities to prevent, prepare for, and respond to conflicts and disasters. And within ACMC, there's even a smaller research team, and they are able to contract projects such as AP4D. The previous executive director, Dr. Alan Ryan, endorsed the AP4D project, and it appealed to us because it takes collaboration between communities within and outside government on a journey to achieve better integration. And both those concepts of collaboration and integration are very interesting to ACMC. AP4D fits neatly with ACMC's mandate to support whole of government and civil society. We like to support new thinking, improvement, engagement between stakeholders and the promotion of good practices. And I want to thank everyone who's been involved. I want to especially thank Melissa for her leadership in this role. And also, also all those in academia and in other organizations who are giving your time freely. It's really appreciated. Thank you very much. Back to you, Melissa. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, we're now going to turn to one of our advisory group members, Dr. Hong Yi Toi from the ASPE, uh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE. Um, one of the things we thought was really important in this project is that from the very beginning, we listened to and incorporated Southeast Asian perspectives in our work. So Hong was part of a dialogue we ran right at the beginning where we asked experts um, from the region to tell us what they thought the key issues were for Australia's engagement in the region. And Hong, as one of uh, Australia's leading Southeast Asia experts, can give us a bit of a quick tour of what are some of the challenges, what are some of the trends that Australia needs to be responding to in the region. Thank you, Melissa. It's a great honor to be um, with you and with the, the process all, all the way. And it's great to be here today with all of you. I see many familiar names and faces um, present um, at this webinar. So hello to everyone. My name is Huang Le Tu and um, I've written extensively on the issues uh, that are of concern to Southeast Asia. And uh, as always, I will make at the outset that it's a very diverse big region. Um, and oftentimes, you know, there's never enough time to really dive into the complexities um, of this region. I'm glad that at the second part of this webinar, we'll go into some specific issues. Um, but I often joke uh, that whatever I say about Southeast Asia, it tends to be true and the reverse as well, because it's such a diverse region that would um, easily uh, uh, accompany, um, uh, accommodate all of those. But a few things that uh, stand out for me in the past few years since the COVID pandemic itself, in particular that I wanted to share with you, um, is that uh, Southeast Asia has been always a very diverse and dynamic region, uh, but there are certain trends that have um, either been accelerated or um, actually brought back to uh, because of this pandemic. And um, one of them is that the region becomes even more diverse, especially in terms of geopolitical, uh, in the context of ge geopolitics. Um, I think uh, that it is really hard to find consensus within the region now um, on 
probably most of the issues, be them the South China Sea, the attitude towards Quad, AUKUS, US, China, and even to the internal uh, crisis with Myanmar. What tends to be um, coming over those divisions is the common interest um, about uh, COVID and COVID recovery. So this is becoming uh, uh, an issue that this diverse region share. All the most biggest concerns is about the impact, the economic impact that COVID has on the region. Uh, as well as social and political, um, but the biggest uh, sort of a common point of consensus for the region is how to recover from this uh, from this uh, overarching crisis. Um, let me go back to uh, a little bit of geopolitics be before we go to other issues. I think um, the region is in a very fragile place, like, like most of the world, um, but there are a, a lot of accumulation of those trends and COVID being one of them, but a really exposed, test and stressed uh, the state capacities uh, of the region and uh, their ability to respond to them. And um, I think the repercussions of COVID can be really detrimental, not only to the economic growth, which has been the story of the region for the past few decades, but also it is uh, risking to undo a lot of regional efforts throughout the decades of pursuing a, a better development, uh, a bridging a development gap, um, uh, and uh, pushing back a lot of people back behind the poverty line and uh, really stalling, if not reverse some of the development goals for years, for vulnerable groups, even for decades. Um, so, and in, increasingly, um, on top of those uh, concerns, there is there are also external pressures coming from the major powers, from external powers, including the great power competition between the US and China, and the decoupling um, different uh, ecosystems, whether it's trade, uh, technology, and others, that uh, put the Southeast Asia in, in, uh, on the spot and what they call as making, uh, uh, forcing them to choose which they don't want. Um, but uh, it is, um, again, you know, exposing their capacity to respond to all of those uh, challenges at once. And I think um, uh, we've already gone beyond that uh, framing that Southeast Asia is just um, you know, uh, a subject of, of external powers, external forces. Increasingly, um, they uh, need and they want to exercise agency. Um, and becoming really um, uh, uh, the force of regional uh, politics. Uh, although this is a struggle, uh, that's, that's the goal that the region wants to set on, ASEAN being at the center of global politics and having that convening role um, of the ASEAN centrality um, and rejecting that sort of uh, just bipolarity and, and uh, the forces that the great power puts on them. But um, behind the scenes, I think uh, behind this rhetoric, there is also um, uh, fair to say that not all individual Southeast Asian countries and policy makers have the appetite to really respond to these new geopolitical trends. Most of them will um, align to the view that the old, uh, you know, sustaining the order, including ASEAN role in it, um, and sustaining peace is the main goal. Um, and while the geopolitical uh, environment is changing and changing very fast, as uh, here in Australia, the policymakers keep emphasizing and reminding of us um, of that to us in Southeast Asia, uh, this is very selective uh, to treat and the rhetoric of that uh, heightened attention um, is often uh, more to the external uh, um, actors, external um, audience rather than domestic audience. Um, and I think, but, but you know, that's, that's, um, that's on the domestic level, but on the real um, practical level, I think Southeast Asia will uh, remain um, pressured because of the geopolitical trends because um, 
China or any other uh, actors have not slowed down, particularly because of COVID. Um, and uh, the COVID impact, economic impact of the COVID will mean that each of the country's defense, posture defense decisions will be extra uh, scrutinized because of their um, uh, economic um, impact and slowdown. So for example, in my recent uh, article about uh, Southeast Asian um, uh, uh, in the Southeast Asia 2020-21-22, where I examine the trends, uh, I give a detailed analysis on, for example, decision of, of defense procurement and the compromises they have to make because of the uh, economic uh, uh, arguments. But that is to, to say that um, the region will remain um, vulnerable uh, cent uh, at the center of geopolitical trends, but with uh, arguably limited resources to respond and, and including um, the economic resources. Um, there are, of course, uh, other than external factors, there are, of course, domestic factors that fuel the instability in, in, within the countries. We've seen um, governments change uh, over the past few years uh, because of the COVID uh, uh, poor responses, like in the case of Malaysia, but also uh, we've seen violent coup, for example, in, uh, in Myanmar um, that is still spilling over to the much larger crisis that not only uh, poses risk to the Myanmar itself, but to the broader region as well. So there are a lot of things happening in, um, in the region. Uh, there are a lot of concerns um, and, and um, instabilities and vulnerabilities in the region. But at the same time, and you know, I, I wanted to use a few minutes to emphasize that um, there is still a great dynamism within um, Southeast Asia. So it's not just a region uh, of potential security threats uh, and instability, but it is also a region that will remain, despite of that, uh, very much center for both old and new phenomena, and that one of the most dynamic hubs of the world. Uh, for example, trade, digital transformation, energy transformation, all the important big developments will rapidly shape the region, the broader in the Pacific, and a lot of them have that uh, propulsion and, and is taking place in Southeast Asia. Uh, my report that just came out today talks about that remarkable digital transformation in Southeast Asia since the pandemic and the roles that other actors, including, South, uh, including Australia, then can play. And this is not just to plug my republication, but also to emphasize that Southeast Asia is not passive, um, it's not waiting for external actors help and initiative, uh, but as a region and as a group and very um, um, demographically young group has that uh, dynamics um, and oftentimes it will be, it will be the one that, uh, that will drive the process and for external actors to uh, mean, uh, to have a say and, and have um, to make a difference, it will have to actually catch up with the processes that are happening in Southeast Asia itself. Uh, so those are a few points that I wanted to make in this complex region, a region that is well, very familiar to many of you in, in this um, webinar. Um, but I think there are, uh, we are in a very transitional period, uh, both for the region, Southeast Asia as a broader Indo-Pacific. Um, there are different appetite and different uh, uh, level of agency that individual uh, Southeast Asian countries would play. Um, um, I think uh, uh, in general, the region will uh, still mean uh, a lot in the global politics, despite certain um, kind of uh, break or slow down that uh, ASEAN as an institution and as an organization tend to uh, put on uh, in certain uh, diplomatic uh, um, processes. Uh, but with that, I think there is more than uh, enough of, of uh, substance and enough of uh, the demand from the region to cooperate with, with Southeast Asia as well as uh, with uh, Australia and uh, enough of the demand for the partnership and uh, going forward. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Huang. And I, I love the way that you've emphasised both the challenges and the dynamism of the region. Um, we've tried very much to reflect that in the material where we look at both risks and opportunities and explain why Australia has a stake in the region. Um, one thing I took away from that session we were at with Southeast Asian Voices, um, well, maybe three things. I, I took away three very strong points. Um, that Southeast Asia wants to be valued in itself. And I think you, you made that very clear. It's not just an arena for outside competition. Um, that Australia needs to respond to Southeast Asia's priorities and to be clear what those are. And that when Australia engages, it has to be on the basis of shared interest. Um, and we tried very hard to reflect all of those points in the work that we're now launching today. So um, without any further ado, um, I'm going to take you through what I think of as a taster. Now, I do not believe I'm going to be able to tell you everything in the 80 pages of reports in a few minutes, but I hope I will be able to convince you that it might be worth looking at them, that there's something that piques your interest and you think, yes, I might look at that in more detail. So what we're launching today looks at how Australia and Southeast Asia can shape this shared future. Um, we, we have five detailed options papers that uh, look at various issues which were identified um, by our working groups and by our, our major consultations as being ones that Australia should look at in more detail. And then we've taken that together and put it into single, I hope, fairly digestible format in a synthesis report of, of the, the length that we hope that people will be able to read. Um, in, in the material, we focus on something that I hope won't be a surprise to so many of the people here, but I think is the message that bears repeating. It's the message, why does Southeast Asia matter? Um, and I think that's very, very often that can get overlooked. Um, I'm conscious, you know, that this week, for example, we'll be talking a lot about the Quad. We've been talking a lot over the recent months about AUKUS. And we want to keep making the case that uh, Australia's Indo-Pacific strategy has to include Southeast Asia. If it doesn't, there's going to be a hole at the centre of the Indo-Pacific strategy that we have. So I would say that at least rhetorically, Southeast Asia has been an important part of Australian policy for many, many decades. Um, we need to keep making that case and having a vision for why Southeast Asia matters, both at the government level, in terms of using all tools of statecraft, and beyond government, having more of a whole of nation approach. So we have a common vision across Australian society with a narrative that galvanises and inspires. And in that spirit, we spent a lot of our time looking at what our vision is. So what does it look like for Australia to be a partner on a range of issues? And it won't surprise you that I, I think there was a lot of enthusiasm for this across all of the working groups. Um, the vision we put forward is very much one of Australia as an active and engaged partner. So deeply integrated with this dynamic and we hope successful region. Um, that idea of understanding Southeast Asia is valuable in its own right. Um, I think the idea of a real partnership based on shared interest, um, mutually beneficial, I mean, that kept coming through. And to some extent, that's a bit of a change in mindset. I, I look back at some of the, you know, some of the documents around Australia and Southeast Asia, and there's this idea of us being helpful, absolutely being helpful, but a little bit detached, a little bit of an outsider. And I think our message is we're an invested insider. We have a stake in Southeast Asia's success, and we have to invest the necessary resources if we want to be the trusted and influential partner in the region. Um, and if we're looking specifically at the 3D side, we would say you need sufficient investment in defence diplomacy and development, and you need effective coordination of each across common strategic objectives. Now, I might respond because there's a question. I love it when people put questions in. Um, I think you're right in terms of uh, Chris Roberts. I think you're in right in terms of obviously Australia's formal Indo-Pacific strategy does include Southeast Asia and has to. So you may feel like I'm, I'm fighting a straw man. But I would ask you, what do you think of public debate? What do you think of media? You know, where would we put uh, how Australian business sees Southeast Asia? What would we look at in terms of language learning? 
So when I'm talking whole of society, whole of nation, I'm talking giving Southeast Asia a much greater priority across all of those sectors. Now, we were very careful in this that we didn't want it to look like we were saying, oh, nobody's doing anything on Southeast Asia. Of course, that's not true. Um, and it's been, as Juan said, a very active time um, over the last few years with a whole range of new initiatives. And of course, we can look back further and see previous governments and all of the initiatives they've had. So we um, took the time in this material to uh, look at some of the examples of existing programs out there, which we see as exemplifying the sort of approach we're talking about, you know, partnership, shares interest, bringing different arms of statecraft together. And this is just a few of the ones that we looked at there. Um, I think of these in many ways as green shoots. You know, there's so much happening in so many places. How can we expand that, help it keep growing, and how can we bring it together? That really, I think, was the, the puzzle we've been looking at here. So I was con we were conscious that if we just said, oh, yes, you're doing everything already, that wouldn't be very interesting for anybody. So we really did challenge each of our working groups to think big, okay? So we asked them to literally picture what does it look like for Australia to be a partner in Southeast Asia in these five different areas that we focused on, recovery and growth, climate leadership, security, civil military cooperation, and overall, how do we behave as a strategically coherent actor? And um, we asked the group to do something I think completely unnatural. If you, if you let human beings just talk about the world, they'll look backwards and they'll be negative. And we said, no, you have to be forward focused, you have to be solutions oriented. You have to be propositional. You have to tell us what you want the world to look like. Um, and I, I'd have to say, I think they all uh, rose um, wonderfully to that challenge that we gave them. So some of the groups, I think, gave us things that are very practical that we can do right now. So for example, the civil military cooperation group, uh, the big animating idea was how can Australia model effective civil military relations to the region. Um, we know civil military relations are an issue. Um, we have, you know, I think Kwong talked a little bit about the rising tide of authoritarianism and some of those issues that are there. Um, what can we be doing in that space? And they've given two very specific examples. One is to bring together regional civil military actors um, through the various capacity building programs Australia runs. Those are currently done by by affairs, by defence, by home affairs, etc. And bringing those together actually is a very important modelling uh, effect. Similarly, looking at the area of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which we know is going to be a growing issue for the region, we can look at how to implement a framework that brings together regional military and civil society. And again, if that piqued your interest, please do go and have a look at the report and some of the information in there. Now, for some of the other groups, I think they stayed with practical and they pushed us a bit to be ambitious. And so for the climate leadership group, they said, what would it look like for Australia to be a climate leader in Southeast Asia? They said that would be actively involved in climate risk assessment for the region, working with the region on the climate uh, disaster preparedness. Um, pulling together a lot of existing initiatives and new initiatives into an Australia-Southeast Asia climate partnership. And then they went even further and said, let's look at the huge opportunity here. What would it look like if Australia were the renewable energy superpower meeting Southeast Asia's green energy transition? What would that look like in terms of you know, cables taking renewable energy, uh, ships taking our green hydrogen, what we're providing in terms of, uh, of lithium and nickel and everything for, for, for uh, electric vehicle batteries and solar panels. So really positive view of what we can potentially do and the benefits for Australia. And then I think probably the group that was most ambitious was the one that said, let's look at ourselves. Um, how do we behave? You know, what's our, what are our structures? What is our culture? How do we get to be a more strategic, coherent actor in the region? And they focused on, on a few levels. One is having a common vision, okay? So a single international engagement strategy that could look like the way, say, that UK has an integrated review. 
what that gives you is a common vision for Southeast Asia, you know, a roadmap which says what are our objectives in this region that means that all parts of government can work towards those. That should include an increase in our activities. Um, and to be successful, I think it has to be supported by, you know, whole of government processes and cultural change by, you know, more engagement and interchange of senior personnel. Because in the end, you need, you know, a, a strategic culture that is sufficiently unified that it's working together towards aims. And in, uh, in this one, uh, you'll see there's a specific um, proposal for what we could do with a new Southeast Asia Economic Cooperation Program. Um, rather than continuing to wait for business to get the message, which hasn't always been as successful, thinking about what we can do more in the lines of development finance institution, perhaps a carbon bank, and how that could have a transformative role in Australia's economic cooperation with Southeast Asia. So, as I say, I hope that's given you a desire to go and read a little bit more. Um, if I was trying to summarise across all the five groups and the dialogue, three dialogues and all the diagnostics, so the, you know more than 150 people we've spoken to, I, that is hard. But I think that there have been some messages I've heard over and over again. Um, so one is that we think we're entering difficult times. That you know, if we look back with hindsight, that perhaps we had a relatively stable environment, and I don't think anyone thinks that it's an easy road ahead. So that means we have to work harder if we're going to remain influential. In talking about how the three arms of statecraft or all arms of statecraft work, um, there was a clear recognition that you need investment and respect for each and understanding that each has a distinct role. They have complementary but different roles in what they can do. And so when we're talking about this 3D approach, we're saying invest and coordinate so that your statecraft as a whole is greater than the sum of its part. Now, of course, none of that will happen without ambition and political will. So one of the things we've been delighted to find is just how much bipartisan support there is um, across uh, for this idea of doing um, more integrated uh, approaches to Australia's international um, engagement. So to show I'm not making that up, here's, here's some messages we have. Um, on the importance of this approach. Maximising our influence means we need to use all the tools we have. Military capability matters, but we need more than that. We need to deploy all aspects of state power, strategic, diplomatic, social, economic. Foreign policy must work with other elements of state power to succeed. In this, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Chief of the Defence Force, General Angus Campbell, has observed that the ADF, as an instrument of hard power, is best at shaping our environment and deterring behaviour that is counter to our interests. When it partners with all the other elements of national power, and in particular with our diplomatic service, our presence on an enduring basis out in the world. ODA is not the only way we support our region. The Australian government is using all the tools of statecraft to play an active role in securing our future. This is a resounding endorsement of Australia's commitment to supporting development, not just through our ODA budget, but through a deeply integrated foreign and development policy. We need greater coordination between development, diplomacy and defence policy. And we need greater involvement by non-government organisations and civil society. So I congratulate ACFID and the International Development Contractors community for their support for the new Asia-Pacific Development, Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue. 
I hope this initiative can help generate new ideas on how Australia can tackle issues of conflict, security, governance and state fragility in our region. And that, of course, is a fantastic level of support for us to be hearing. Um, given this interest from across, uh, from across uh, government to politics, one of the things we've done is to give private briefings ahead of today's launch to parliamentarians, to parliamentary officers, to departments and agencies. And so far, I think we've had more than a dozen involving more than 50 people to share insights from these uh, reports ahead of launch. So we're delighted that uh, two of the, those have asked us to share messages um, today at the launch. So first, we will hear from the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator the Honourable Louise Payne. The Asia-Pacific Development, Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue is a valuable contribution at a time of rapid change. Those of us who live in the Indo-Pacific know that we're in the world's most dynamic region. Nowhere else in the world is change happening more rapidly. The character of the regional and international order that is emerging will determine Australia's security and prosperity, and that of our partners, over the 21st century. As strategic competition sharpens in the Indo-Pacific, we can shape our future through the decisions we make and the actions that we take together with our partners. Australia wants to see a region that empowers countries of all sizes to engage and prosper in an open, inclusive and rules-based environment. Southeast Asia is central to this regional vis vision and ASEAN sits at its heart. In our view, the principles of ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific should guide the post-pandemic order in the region. Openness, transparency, inclusivity, and a rules-based region with ASEAN at the centre. With that perspective in mind, Australia welcomes new opportunities to further engage with our partners in Southeast Asia and ASEAN. We are supporting sustainable and high quality infrastructure. We're delivering scholarships and training to build the capacity of the people in the Mekong subregion. We're sharing technical knowledge to strengthen trade and investment across the region. And we are bolstering environmental sustainability, responding to climate change, improving water security and tackling marine pollution. This engagement is backed by substance through the $500 million landmark package for Southeast Asia that the Prime Minister announced in 2020 and the further $154 million we are investing into our partnership with ASEAN to mark the establishment of our comprehensive strategic partnership between ASEAN and Australia. We have also delivered 18 million vaccines across six Southeast Asian countries to support the region's health security and recovery. Engaging with ASEAN and supporting our partners in Southeast Asia is one of the best investments Australia can make in a stronger, more prosperous and more secure future for the Australian people and for our region. Australia and ASEAN share a vision it's a shared future. And by working with our regional partners, the Australian government is making sure we can deliver it together. Thank you to the Minister for sharing her thoughts with us today. Now we'll hear from the Shadow Minister for International Development Pacific and Shadow Minister Assisting for Defence, Pat Conroy, MP. Good afternoon, and thank you to the organisers of this symposium for the opportunity to make a few brief remarks. I want to start by welcoming the formation of the Asia-Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue. AP4D is an important initiative because now more than ever, Australia needs innovative thinking on foreign policy. We need more strategic and joined up thinking across the domains of diplomacy, defence and development. And we need more collaboration and better partnerships between government, academia, civil society and the private sector. That's why for me, the formation of AP4D was a light bulb moment, a powerful idea whose time has come, to paraphrase Victor Hugo. So I want to thank the Australian Council for International Development, the Australian National University, the International Development Contractors Community and the Institute for Regional Security for founding this new organisation. Australia faces a profoundly challenging geopolitical environment 
with a shifting balance of power and rising strategic competition in our region. We also face a generational challenge in international development due to the COVID pandemic. The World Bank has estimated that COVID increased the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world by 97 million in each of 2020 and 21. 2020 was the first year in two decades to see an increase in the level of extreme poverty. Climate change will present further challenges for Australia's national interests and international relations. Climate change poses risks not only to the environment, but also to economic development, human welfare and national security. And the Asia Pacific is one of the regions most exposed to the impacts of rising temperatures, rising sea levels and more frequent extreme weather events. Given this highly challenging international environment, it is crucial for Australia to deploy all the arms of statecraft in a more coordinated and strategic fashion. Today's symposium and the continuing work of AP4D will make an important contribution to this effort. I particularly welcome AP4D's focus on Southeast Asia for the initial phase of its research program. My colleague, Labor Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Penny Wong, has spoken about the need to elevate Southeast Asia and Australia's strategic and foreign policy settings. Labor believes Australia needs to deepen engagement in Southeast Asia to support our shared pandemic recoveries, to build resilience to future threats and to strengthen security alliances and commitments to a rules-based international order. Today's symposium will launch a series of AP4D options papers that are the result of months of deliberations by regional experts from across the fields of diplomacy, development and defence. This is a body of work that sets out both a strategic vision and a series of specific proposals for a stronger engagement with Southeast Asia. This represents a valuable input to Australian foreign policy making. I look forward to learning more about this work and I wish you well in your discussions today. And thank you very much to both the Minister and the Shadow Minister. Now, we're going to change gear a little bit now, and we'd like to dive into a discussion about the material, about the body of work that we're launching today. And there's room and time to be interactive. So I would ask you, please do use the Q&A function, thoughts you have, things you would like to discuss further. We would love to hear your thoughts. So what we're going to have is um, some people who've been involved in the working groups that uh, prepared each of these papers. And can I say they worked very, very hard. So it was not a quick process. We had um, a, our research at the start. We had diagnostic sessions. We then had three separate dialogues, both the Southeast Asian experts and then for Australia's defence development and diplomacy communities. Um, from that, we surfaced uh, topics that the group thought were of the, the highest priority um, that, were, that we should work on further, and people put up their hands to be involved in working groups. Now, in some cases, they had a few meetings. In some cases, they had, you know, half a dozen meetings, um, working away on text, on ideas, sharing their insights. They had, uh, they prepared some uh, draft material, and we were delighted to get feedback from that both from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Department of Defence, who uh, uh, um, provided uh, uh, first assistant secretary and two assistant secretaries to come and give uh, useful um, off the record advice and input um, to really hone the messages that we had. So I'm now going to turn to the first of our groups, which was looking at what does it look like for Australia to be an effective security partner with Southeast Asia. And delighted to, uh, that we have joining us Bridie Rice, who was one of the founding co conveners of AP4D. She's the CEO of Development Intelligence Lab. And John Blackslot, who's from the Security and Defence Studies Centre at ANU. So, Bridie, nice quick one. What messages do you want people to take away from this report? Look, I think this report really sets out three major challenges for Australia's security in Southeast Asia. So the first is geostrategic competition. There's no doubt about it. The second, though, is the impact of climate change on the region. And the third is accountable governance, I guess what we heard the minister call a rules-based order. And there's no doubt that this group in this paper is saying that we are facing tough geostrategic headwinds, but that if we 
overemphasize this to the exclusion of other really key security challenges, then it's going to lead us as a nation to focus exclusively on the risks of conflict and maybe miss an opportunity to generate some of the rewards of increasing our development and our diplomacy outputs. Rewards like better relationships with the region, better trade, better influence, frankly, better human security outcomes for the people in Southeast Asia. So I guess that's really the key message and my takeaway from this working group on the paper. It's that to be a great security partner in Southeast Asia, we need to make sure we're not seeing Southeast Asia as only a theatre of geostrategic competition, but that we can actually jump on the dynamism that Huang Lei Tu was, was articulating so well, increase our cooperation across the development and the diplomacy domains. And the key message is that let's not wait. There are some great ideas in this paper that can be taken forward immediately and in the medium and long term too. Fantastic. Well, over to you, John. I mean, you're from SDSC, so I think people might associate that with hard security approaches. But this paper very much talks about human security and hard state security as complementary and mutually reinforcing paradigms. Why do you say this? So it's really interesting. We've got to get our heads in the mindset of our Southeast Asian neighbours. If we want to understand how they view the world and if we want to have a positive influence on that view of the world, we need to understand them. And uh, at the moment, you know, we're, we're, we're starting from a low base, you know, it's that great line from Alice in Wonderland, if that's where you wanted to be, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, and unfortunately, it's where we are. You know, we're barely monolingual in Australia. Um, we're not very culturally uh, attuned. Um, we're getting better, uh, I think, and uh, we are more engaged. But when we think about, you know, the, our, our predilection in, 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 the, in the strategic and defence studies domain uh, for hard power, our, our neighbours in Southeast Asia on one level are kind of happy for it because they know that to their south, there's this relatively benign neighbour who has been over the, in the years since the Second World War, has been well disposed towards them, pretty well a, a, a partner nation with them. Um, uh, you know, you can argue the, the edges on that one, but in broad terms, that's, I think, a, a truism. Um, and, and yet at the same time, they're, they're sandwiched between uh, the great powers in Southeast Asia. They're much closer to China. So while they appreciate the significance of great power contestation, they don't want to have to go and too publicly declare their hand on issues that are going to then uh, invite reproach. But also, as Bridie was saying, for them, there are many other issues that are really, really pressing. Um, uh, the Philippines has had typhoons, are plenty. It's had, uh, we've had tsunami waves. We've had uh, enormous challenges in terms of the environment. The pandemic has added a layer on that of, of incredible complexity and heartache for many, many people. Uh, and then, of course, we've got a spectrum, as, as we talked about, a spectrum of governance challenges that makes our bilateral and multilateral relationships quite complicated. So, you know, we've got border force engaging with Indonesia, we've got the defence force engaging with Indonesia, Indonesia being an example and the most significant example of our engagement with the, with the region. We have a defence asso uh, association, the Ikahan Network of alumni of uh, Indonesians and Australians have studied together, which is a positive step. In fact, often adds ballast to the relationship between Australia and Indonesia. But we have a game of snakes and ladders going on here, you know. We incrementally improve relationships over, over issues and then be it beef, boat, spies, Clemency Timor, Papua Jerusalem, we poke them in the eye and down the, down the snake we ride. So we, we, we need to somehow find a way to uh, stabilise the relationship, not just for our own benefit, but in terms of security, but in terms of the general well-being of the neighbourhood. And I guess the point here too, Melissa, really critical, is that you can't think, and this Bridie was onto this, you can't think about defence and security as this kind of uh, you know, air-gapped compartment of policy priorities and functions. It's got to be integrated with the approach we take on all of these other issues. Thanks. Mm. Well, I'm going to continue on with that. Um, but before I do, I should just remind audience members, this is your chance 
this is your chance to put questions, post comments, whatever it is. And I tell you, John and, and Bridie are up for, for curly ones. Don't worry, put them in. So, so Bridie, you were the founding co-convener for, for um, AP4D. So clearly you think there is value in bringing together development, diplomacy and defence. I'm interested, how did you find the working group process of working with people across the sectors on this paper? Yeah, it was up there with um, with one of the most cracking professional experiences I could imagine. Certainly, um, Michael, uh, I remember sitting in Michael Wesley's office when this idea was just in its fledgling stages, saying, "We just need real, honest conversations. Where, how do I learn what a hawk really thinks about national security when I'm sitting here in in my little lane of of development?" And vice versa, I felt like I had something to give. Um, so these working groups, I think, really played that out. Um, we were able to exchange email correspondence on a daily basis. We were able to put the likes of John Plaxlin um, right in there beside a Feminist Foreign Policy Coalition member and have amazing conversations where we not only learned about a very different perspectives, but actually came through with a hell of a lot more common ground than I had imagined. So I would say that for anybody who, who really wants to contribute their particular expertise into a broader foreign policy debate, this is a space for you, but also anybody who's serious about challenging their own biases, then this is a really critical thing that I think is key for the next generation of foreign policy leaders in Australia. We can't stay in our lanes in development, diplomacy and defence. And I think this initiative is really, really key to generating genuinely more integrated and forward looking solutions. It's hard work. It's really tough, um, but I think it's it's a super exciting thing and I can't wait to be involved in the next iteration. Fantastic. And I see some questions are coming through, so we're going to, to go with that. Um, so uh, Tamlin BC asks, what has been the response to this thinking in Southeast Asia? You know, are we seeing the same sort of approach? Uh, and I know from the AP4D perspective, we've looked a lot at what's been happening in the US, in the UK, there's a bit in Canada, there's a bit in Netherlands. But um, I have to say, I haven't seen as much of it happening. I'm interested, Bridie, John, do you, do you have a view on that? I'll let you go first, Bridie, if you like. Oh, that wasn't a very good team move, John. Um, look, in Southeast Asia, my, um, my hunch from the dialogues that we had, particularly with our Southeast Asian counterparts and, and having worked in the region a little bit, is that the idea of thinking about security in these binary hard security versus human security terms just doesn't exist in, the, in a lot of places in the region the way that it does here in Australia. So for example, when you're speaking to Southeast Asian leaders at the forefront of their minds and in a very fluent way, they will be talking about the very significant security challenges of needing to educate or vaccinate their population. Something that we would think about as a development issue, but they might be thinking about as a security issue. So I think what I probably offer into that discussion is that the, the silos that we have in our policy making, perhaps between development, defence, diplomacy and different arms of security, simply don't exist in the strategic imagination of the people that we're engaging with in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. But John, you might have you might have more understanding on this. Problem. Yeah, look, I, I, I agree with you, Bridie. I mean, I think uh, people in Southeast Asia have an acute sense of their own vulnerability on, on you know, on all of the human security measures, uh, metrics, if you like. Um, I think also, you know, while it's it's easy for us to get partisan about things, I think broadly, uh, and and there's an inclination to be critical of the government for the Quad and for AUKUS and for de-emphasising Southeast Asia. Uh, my my impression is that it, in, when I engage in Southeast Asia, people are actually quite appreciative of the efforts that Australia goes to uh, with the Mekong initiatives uh, and uh, various other, you know, the 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 the, sc the scholarship programs the uh, investment uh, activities that were involved in women, peace and security. There's a, there's a whole range of uh, mechanisms that are employed um, that, uh, that don't get a lot of airplay, don't get a lot of publicity, but the, the practitioners in Southeast Asia, by and large, recognise Australia is a player in the space. Uh, and my sense is that um, what, we, what we're talking about with AP4D is, is kind of about ratcheting up because a lot of the stuff that we're wanting to see the government do more and Australia as a nation engaging more constructively on is a range of activities that kind of, they're already kind of happening. They just need to be muscled up. 
they need to uh, they need to have a, a more constructive and high profile engagement on on these issues and they need to be better resourced and they need to be hold, more holistically managed and approached so you know and I, I think it's very interesting you know when you think about it you go to talk to some of these people sometimes we Australians and I hear I'm, I'm including the policy makers in in, in the di diplomacy space will be better across some of these issues than some of the individuals in, in the various Southeast Asian countries because they may not be speaking with each other all that well um, and that we, we can actually sometimes act as a facilitator. Uh, okay. And as long as we do that with a degree of humility, uh, which isn't our strong suit, I have to confess, you know, um, <laughs> but it, it, if we take a, a, a slightly more humble approach and a constructive approach and a collegial approach, uh, we're going to we're going to get a lot more headway. But the bottom line is that there's a lot of goodwill in the region. There's a lot of I think also recognise that we're we're we are we're whizzy widge people. You know what you see is what you get. We don't have um, we don't have much nuance, and most of our interlocutors kind of you know shrug a little bit at us. They think you know we're not terribly subtle, we're not terribly sophisticated, but we're our hearts in the right place. And I think with that in mind. <laughs> There is a lot of opportunity for us to do more. Well, and at least we're self-aware about it, if nothing else. So I'll just go one last question and you just get a yes or no answer. John and Bridey, do we need a new national strategic language pro uh, policy that's from Dex Trading for Trade Asia? Yes or no? Yes, please. Absolutely. Yep, send it through, get involved. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, I am going to have to move to our next group because I want all of them to have a little bit of time to speak. Um, we're having technical difficulties with one of our speakers, so I'm going to move on to our group who looked at Australia as a catalyst for civil military cooperation. So if I can welcome, please, Greta nabs uh, from the University of Queensland and Hunter Marston from ANU, who is now online. So, Greta, I'll start with you. I mean, you're from the defence background. You worked in defence. Um, what does civil military cooperation mean to you? Oh, thanks, Melissa. And I just want to preface my uh, response with what a privilege it was to be involved um, in AP4D. And, and I think, you know, it brings together the ideas and thinkings of many practitioners and, and researchers working in the space. So I, I want to congratulate you and the team uh, on its establishment. I think civil military cooperation, uh, Melissa, to me, uh, means about fundamentally armed forces and security force personnel working together with communities and civilian actors on non-traditional or non-core military tasks, something in, in military parlance, which we often call operations other than war, and, and, and is uh, indeed termed that within in the region and places like Indonesia. I think uh, traditionally notions of CIMIC, uh, civil military cooperation, are conjured images of soldiers going out to villages and, and, and building bridges and, and, and digging wells, but I think that's become a much more sophisticated uh, concept with new policy, doctrinal and, and operational precepts. Um, the important thing about CIMIC, I think, is it includes a really broad range of stakeholders from the security force actors. And here I want to emphasize Melissa and note uh, our AFP contributor on our working paper here. It's not just about military, it's paramilitary police, think Coast Guard, think aviation security officials, think border immigration officials are fundamentally part of this concept of civil military cooperation. And it's, and it's those um, security force actors working in partnership with civilian agency personnel, increasingly from central and, and regional uh, government agencies, and of course, civil society organisations and faith-based organisations. Um, yeah. And I think as, as a lot of our contributors have acknowledged uh, today, it's becoming ever more important, this need for a joined up coordinated approach uh, in the face of the pandemic crisis, but also um, seismic and climate change induced uh, natural disasters. Absolutely. Well, over to Hunter. I mean, you've been embedded as a diplomat and researched civil society in Southeast Asia. I mean, why should Australia care about the state of civil society in its region? Thank you very much for having me, uh, Melissa, uh, and uh, congratulations on the uh, re release of this great report uh, and a series of reports. Um, it was a pleasure to work on this uh, specific um, uh, part of that. Um, I would say 
a couple of reasons why it's in Australia's interest uh, to uh, work with civil society in the region. Uh, first and foremost, civil society is a means for Australia to essentially create and expand partnerships in the region with democratic um, and uh, progressive groups uh, that share Australia's values, uh, as well as enhance political stability and economic growth within those countries, which will redound to Australia's benefit and the people of Australia in the long run. Thank you, Hunter. Um, now, could I, I'll just go to one of the recommendations in the report. Um, one of the things that's proposed is bringing together civil and military actors, um, both for capacity building and in humanitarian disaster relief. I mean, my question is, does this not happen already? And if not, why not? Um, look, it does happen, but it's more on an ad hoc basis, I'd say, Melissa. And, and I wanted to draw attention to this, this uh, the options paper on Australia as a strategically coherent actor and needing to look at ourselves as well. I mean, we're talking about um, greater whole of government coordination in the region, but we need to, we need to take a, you know, a leaf out of that book and, and look at how things are coordinated uh, indeed in, in Canberra and, and beyond. So I think, look, in answer your question you can yeah you know, sometimes on occasion for example you'll see a broad range of participants on dvat funded australia wars uh, short courses which are aimed at skills development and capacity building in the, uh, southeast asia and the indo-pacific beyond but it's still the exception and i think in contrast as a former uh, defense policy intelligence officer the D dcp the defense cooperation program education training activities they naturally focus on capacity building for armed forces personnel and to a lesser extent um civilian defense ministry um public servants but the evidence from my own experience, Melissa, as a former practitioner and indeed consulting with current practitioners with regard to our options paper uh, is that the defence scholarships, the Australian Federal Police Capacity Building Programs and the Australia Awards Programs, they mainly operate separately and we need a more whole of government approach to scholarships, to awards uh, and to training that can support greater collaboration. The important thing I also want to add here, Melissa, is there's some structural concerns constraints here, or policy constraints, uh, which, which uh, militate against greater coordination. And that's that official development assistance, Australian ODA, uh, cannot be directed towards active military personnel. So this means it's more difficult to have participants from regional armed forces on Australian aid funded training programs unless they're in civilian roles, which of course is kind of an arbitrary distinction in many states in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know in some of the papers we've talked about how do we creatively blend um, official development assistance and other funding in order to have the, the sort of impact we want in the region. So um, over to Hunter, I mean, one of the other recommendations in the paper is about building stronger links between Australian civil society and Southeast Asian civil society. And, and may I note, we do have at least one representative in the audience. So thank you to Him Raksmi, who's at the Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace, an organisation I've worked with over many years. Um, I'm interested, you know, where do you see the possibilities of working more together? Uh, thanks, Melissa. A couple of things here. Um, first, I think the Southeast Asian diaspora in Australia, which is of significant size, is an important conduit for people to people exchange, as well as Australians working in and embedded in civil society in Southeast Asia. Uh, those linkages are, are vital to creating this uh, broader community and dialogue of ongoing civil society engagement, uh, which the Australian government can tap into and leverage. Um, the report we issued uh, has a few case study examples, which I think uh, are excellent, and I would direct your attention to. Um, one is the Mekong Australia Partnership on Transnational Crime, and there are a variety of other uh, Mekong specific civil society groups uh, working adjacent to government uh, on issues of transnational crime, as well as climate change, uh, fisheries protection, and other uh, resource management issues. Um, and another case study uh, the report highlights is that of the Australia Awards Women in Leadership in the Security Sector, which is one way of sort of praising and, and calling out uh, champions within the security sector who uh, reflect Australia's values and uh, civil military relations here. Uh, and finally, this report puts, puts forward uh, what we call a regional military civil society framework uh, with some important steps 
entailing collaboration on HADR uh, and other uh, ADF uh, cooperative uh, mechanisms, uh, which uh, can all be found in the report. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you both very much. Again, I'm hoping this has whetted people's appetite and they want to go and read the full paper. It's not too big a read. Um, what I'm going to turn to now is our partner for recovery and growth group. We've been hoping uh, that we'd also be joined for one of the people from our climate leadership group, but for whatever reason, he hasn't been able to get on the line yet. So we're going to kick off and if he joins us, he will. So if I can turn then to our recovery and growth group, um, we have Helen Evans, um, who's from the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security and the University of Melbourne's Nossal Institute for Global Health. So Helen, I mean, obviously your career has been a huge one in public health um, and that's the focus of this paper. Can you tell me a bit more about why were health, education and economic cooperation chosen as the focus for Australia's efforts in helping Southeast Asia's recovery and growth? Thanks, Melissa, and thanks for being part of it. And, and this session has been really interesting. I did want to just clarify, I'm not with the Indo-Pacific Regional Centre for Health Security. I'm on their advisory group, uh, but I am with Melbourne University Nossal Centre for Global Health. So just clarify that. Yeah, so why um, why health education and economic cooperation is a, is a key focus of this paper? And I think there are two major reasons. I mean, what, the first one is that there's been a tendency, I think, in the past to see um, health and education as desirable outcomes uh, of economic growth. And, and that's absolutely the case. But I think equally important is that health and education are really essential drivers of sustainable economic growth and sustainability and security that goes with that, which in turn benefits us all, including Australia. And I, I, I think that poor and unequal growth within and between countries in the region creates uh, alienation um, and fragmentation of society and it's most extreme, you know, the growth of fundamentalist movements. So I was interested in Bridie's comment about the feedback they're getting about security and, um, you know, health and development uh, being seen as a security issue. So you can't separate out economic growth from health ed and education. And I think this is something that public health and development people have known for a long time, well before the pandemic. Um, mm. And indeed, it's in the white paper, the foreign policy white paper, that, that link. It's unfortunately, not a view shared by everybody, as we saw in Australia and in other countries, uh, where there was a debate about an either or, is it economic development or is it, you know, strong public health measures. And now I think we've got multiple studies coming out showing that countries uh, that put their public health measures first ended up recovering from economic recession as well as, if not better than those um, who just let it all rip. And I'd like to think we've learned that lesson, although I wouldn't be 100% confident. So that's one reason. The second reason why we focused on health development um, and economic cooperation is that Australia's prosperity and security is inextricably linked with this region, as a number of people have said today, and it's growing and changing fast. It's also now uh, quite vulnerable because of the pandemic. We've got a lot to offer in this area, these three areas in Australia. We already have a very well-established reputation in health and education services that's been built up over many years and in multiple sectors. So it's not just tertiary sector and research institutes, but it's also non-government, civil society and private sector, as a number of people have said. But I want to stress that I don't see education and health services simply as commodities that we can sell as a sort of once off, which I think there has been a bit of a tendency to see it. Um, as uh, you know, people talked about education as a cash cow. I think we need to see the advantages as much longer term and deeper. And, uh, and we said in the paper that we can and should use these skills and resources to strengthen links uh, and enable policy and knowledge, knowledge exchange and that includes tech transfer. And we put an example about the Therapeutic Goods um, Authority, which is, is doing that currently. And in my experience, particularly, but not only in health, people in the region are really looking for opportunities to network for professional development, for alumni support. And this helps to build positive trusting relationships with countries, but also with uh, regional institutions. So that's why health uh, education and economic cooperation all together. 
Thank you. And, and I think you've made the case very well, you know, why this means that this is not just an issue for development, it's also an issue for defence and diplomacy. Now, I'm very sorry, it looks like we are not going to see Jack today. We've been trying to see if he can get on, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Um, so what I might do is give a, a little uh, taste of what's in the, the climate paper. Now, I did it already in my quick synopsis, but um, maybe I can answer Dermot O'Gorman's question from WWF on Australia, the renewable energy superpower. I think that was the positive and galvanising vision that came through in this paper. What a transformation that would be, not just um, economically for Australia, but also in terms of our diplomatic heft, in the way that we were seen in the region, if we were the country that was supplying the critical energy needs. Um, and uh, certainly the paper says that we think there is a real appetite in the region for this. Um, as the region, one of the regions in the world that is most vulnerable to climate impacts, Southeast Asian policymakers are very focused on this area and there is a strong appetite for working with countries to help on this green energy transition. And so the idea of Australia positioning itself um, in that way and the dividends we get across the board, I think, um, is a very, very strong one. So if I can just do that very quickly. Um, now, we have a, a question, I think it's really a comment from Gary Quinman because he was very much involved in this paper and uh, we we're very delighted for his input throughout. Um, he mentions in the synthesis paper that we've included a speech that the PM could give um, in 2025. And, and look, it's fair, as you say, Gary, perhaps that speech should be this year or next year. Um, I think I pushed the author a little bit to say, let's try and imagine a time to get into the future. But absolutely. Um, in that speech, we were very much trying to show that there can be political capital and political mileage from doing Southeast Asia well and trying to show what that can do. Okay, now I think I, thank you again, Helen. I think I should move to our final paper to make sure that they get some time because they told me they were concerned that as the last paper, they would probably get no attention at all. And I want to prove that that's not true. So if I can now turn to Richard Moore, one of the founding co-conveners of AP4D, um, who has represented the international development and contractors community and William Stoltz, who's from the National Security College. They did their paper, they were part of the, the large working group who were working on Australia as a strategically coherent actor. So I'm gonna start off with a simple question. Richard, what do you mean by this strategic coherence idea? Thanks, Melissa. Um, I, I think in a sense, we've been talking about it all, all morning uh, and, and people have put a different slant on it. Uh, it's really about us being joined up um, and then following through on what we say we're going to do. Um, and maybe a third element of it is once we've set our strategic goals and we've articulated them, we get people lined up behind them, that we actually then take a systems approach and we make sure that strategy, policies, programs, and people are all aligned so that we can actually deliver on, on the goals. And I guess it's in some of those areas where we, we found that we were pretty good at setting out what, what we want as a nation, articulating our interests and, and acknowledging those of others and, and, and going for a sort of shared narrative, but we were less good at uh, following through and making sure that we deliver, uh, resulting in quite consistent advice to us that we send mixed messages. And, and as a result, sometimes we confuse people about well, in the region about what Australian policy is really all about. So we, we, we saw quite a lot of opportunity to uh, address that and achieve better results overall as a consequence. We certainly don't want to be seen as hot and cold. Um, so, William, obviously you've worked inside government, so I'm sure you've seen firsthand why strategic coherence is sometimes difficult to achieve. I mean, why do you think we should try? Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, you know, I think there's two elements to that. There is a domestic and an international element. You know, obviously we, we exist in a, a liberal democracy. The government has to build a social license and a degree of public support for the initiatives that it seeks to undertake abroad. So I think that there's a sense that, you know, the government of the day needs to be able to communicate to the public 
why it's spending the money it is spending on foreign affairs and defence and these sorts of initiatives. So it needs to be coherent in, in, in that sense. But I think in the international contents, uh, context, in the most serious instance, I suppose strategic, uh, we, we need to achieve strategic coherence, um, you know, it, as a means to signal resolve and credibility to Southeast Asia, um, that Australia is truly committed to the security and the development um, of this region and that we are actually reinforcing our words with actions. Um, and then I think there's also an element of the extent to which um, strategic coherence is actually very critical to uh, supporting deterrence, you know, and, and, and asserting to our um, adversaries in the region who may not have the same type of vision for the region that we have, that uh, the Australian government, well, Australia will be there, Australia will back up um, its vision for the region and, and, the, and safeguard the future of the region with action. So I think um, there's, a, there's a strong credibility piece there to supporting de deterrence as well. Thank you. So that's the, the case four. Now let me ask a bit more about how it can be achieved. So, so Richard, the starting point for the papers is having a, a common vision as, some, as a, keynote, a keystone to coherence. Um, tell us more, how, how do you think we can get that common vision? Thanks, Melissa. And, and, and here I'd sort of say that, that I think we agreed as a, as, as a group that there was a real dilemma between a fortress Australia approach focused overwhelmingly on hard security and then our economic and, and wider interests, which are much more likely to be advanced through openness. Now, uh, again, we don't see this as either or, we see it as possible to craft policy where Australia is both open and secure, but we haven't really taken that, um, you, you know, we, have, we haven't pursued that in earnest. So what we're saying is, okay, it's time for us to think again, it's a very complicated world. Even, even, even the author of the uh, uh, foreign uh, policy white paper, in 2017, Richard Maud has sort of said, well, you know, the well has changed so much, we need to go back to the drawing board. So we're proposing a fully fledged integrated review on the lines of the UK model. In other words, not preempting everything, but sitting down and doing some very serious strategic work, uh, trying to join it all up. So we'd have a common set of strategic goals. Uh, and then, as I said before, making sure we think about, well, what's needed to realize those, what capability, what resourcing, what rebalancing. Um, and we think we need to, to do that on a Southeast Asia basis as well. So we're looking to a Southeast Asia roadmap for what our future relations would look like. Um, and uh, enhanced coordination. We think we're great at whole of government in a crisis, not so good when we're thinking medium longer term and so we think there might there's either a need to beef up DFAT and really give it the clout and the responsibility the accountability to do that or you look to some other part of government like PM and C either way we think this has to be um, tackled because at the moment our strategic policy is unbalanced um, we do the hard stuff pretty well the other stuff uh, less well um, and we need to bring it bring it all together um, mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, William, um, one of the things I really noticed about this working group is you just generated so many different options and so many different pathways. I think there were probably a dozen different agencies, government departments where you had recommendations. Tell me a bit about some of those pathways that you've suggested in here. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, I think that the one, you know, it's a, it's a group effort. Everyone owns all of these. The, the one I suppose that excites me the most and that I think is perhaps the most critical is the, the integrated review um, that, that Richard suggested, you know, akin to what the UK is um, currently going through implementing. You know, we have in Australia this tradition that goes back to the 1970s of kind of articulating our um, international strategies through these kind of piecemeal white papers um, which I think have served us well for the previous era, but the reality is, is you know, we're moving into, or we are, you know, already in um, a, a much more complicated, fast-moving, high-risk international environment where we need to mobilise all the all the levers of, of Australian state power um, that are, you know, that are held resident within government, but also in the non-government sector as well. And that's why I think we need to turn away from this portfolio specific ways of planning um, strategies in that siloed way. We need to have a really holistic appreciation that Australia's international efforts 
its presence abroad does not simply reside in one department um, and therefore we can't plan it in that way. Uh, and so I think, you know, this idea of a, a kind of very coherent, credible articulation of our international vision through an integrated review um, is really quite urgent. And I think the thing to emphasise there is that it, it needs to carry um, political support and there needs to be political will behind it. Um, something that we kind of kept returning to in this discussion of strategic coherence is the extent to which sometimes the, 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 the public service can lead in strategic action um, is somewhat overstated. Ultimately, we are only ever as strategically coherent as the political will and the political discipline to actually see through um, a, a strategic objective um, at that, you know, at that government level. So um, it's very important that any, any kind of document um, set piece that's created by the public service is really committed to um, by the government of the day and isn't just set there on the shelf to gather dust, I suppose. Absolutely. And again, that's a perspective of someone who's been there. So thank you. Uh, and again, thank you to all of the members of the Strategic Coherence Working Group and all of the members of every one of the working groups. Now, what I'll do is uh, we have a couple of questions that we haven't fully answered yet, and I think it would be worth uh, just throwing open to any of the working group members who'd like to. So one first was on gender and how it fits into AB4D. Um, Bridie has talked a little bit about how gender and particularly um, the feminist foreign policy agenda fitted into the human security paper um, and do have a look at that. Uh, but I think Helen, you wanted to respond on that as well. So just trying to unmute. Um, Thank you, Helen. Yeah, I think, I think gender is absolutely key because as we know from this pandemic, but more generally, uh, women and children are the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged, but they also underpin um, society. They underpin, uh, you know, the health and well-being of, of their family and the progress. So if women are disadvantaged, if women die young, children disadvantaged, girls get out of school, etc. So I think it has to be a key, a key part of any any approach we take on this. Melissa, can I just take this opportunity to say also, I think we're talking about governments, and I think integrated approach totally agree with that. Longer term, let's stop the siloed project-based quick fixes, but also we need to bring the general community along with us. I don't think that there's a good understanding out in the Australian population that this is really uh, an investment um, in all our futures and our security and, and stability. Uh, I think we need to move, looking at development, we need to move away from the concept of charity and all of that connotes and donor recipient, the whole partnership. But we need to actually, we need to actually somehow get better better uh, ideas and understanding conveyed out into the broader community because the politicians will not follow if they don't see there's any any votes in it. Sorry, I'll and stop look, there. I couldn't, no, I couldn't think of a better way to end this discussion because I think that's so much what we're trying to do with this work. We're not just talking to the people who already know that Southeast Asia is important, already know that we should have um, the, all our arms of state staff working together. We're trying to take the general community along with us, as Helen has said. So we've had a uh, piece out today, for example, in the Mandarin. Um, we have a piece coming out in pursuit next week in the conversation. We'll be pushing this message as much as we can in blogs, in podcasts, in media, in whatever way we can. And we've tried very hard to make it accessible in the sense that it's a vision that you can read and try to understand and find galvanizing. So I would like to thank everybody who's been involved um, in this process too the government representatives, to our advisory group members, to everyone of our working group members, to people who've attended our consultations and dialogues, and to everyone who's listened to us and, can I say, stuck around right till the end. Thank you to every one of you. Um, I remind you, if you haven't read all of the beautiful papers, please do go to the AP4D website and have a look at them and share them with other people so they can see them too. Um, for us, we're just about to start our Pacific component. So um, if, uh, if you are equally interested in the Pacific Islands as in Southeast Asia, please do come along and be part of those discussions. 
Our dialogue will be on the 22nd of February. You're very welcome to uh, register if you're part of any of the communities and have an interest in the Pacific. And um, we look forward to sharing the results of that process with you in around June. So if I can say a big thanks again, uh, particularly to the Australian Civil Military Centre, without whom we simply could not have done this work, and to everybody who's been part of the wonderful AP4 day that has made this program possible. Thank you again for joining us today.